Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, I am so excited to have Bernadette Banner with me. If you guys don't know Bernadette Banner, you have got to go check out her YouTube channel. We'll be talking about her new book that's out right now. And uh, here we go. Get it up there. (laughs) And uh, we are going to be covering some of the basics of a time-tested, a long-standing skill that is really near and dear to my heart, but not nearly as near and dear to my heart as it is to Bernadette's heart, and that is sewing. And this is something that I think we just don't really talk a lot about in the modern world, do we? Yes, I would say so. And especially, there are many methods of sewing that have been lost across time. Now nowadays there's so much focus placed on the machine sewing because that is, you know, the quickest and the fastest and the easiest, but there are a lot of really handy techniques that are done by hand, incidentally, that we've just sort of lost. And it's good to sort of bring the conversation back around to that and say, actually wait, this worked really well. Why did we stop doing this? Oh, this just makes me so excited. And um I know. I'm, j- I'm like just threw you right in. So hi, Bernadette. How are you? Thanks hi. for joining hi. us today. I'll go back to all the intro stuff because I'm so excited about this topic. I want to like dive right in. But tell us a little bit about you. Where do you live? Uh, what's what's the weather like around you right now? What are you up to? What projects are you uh, involved in? <laughs> Uh, well, I am a New Yorker originally, but I currently live in London. So it is, you know what, the weather is arguably very much the same. I will make that controversial statement, but you know, it, well, it's a bit cooler here now. Uh, it's summer, not not quite so sweltering hot, usually as it is in New York. But. Good. Yeah, that's, uh, I think you know, there's the constant conversation about really what is normal, right? Because yes, every year, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay. So what sort of projects are you working on right now? Anything in particular? Uh, many things, always many, many, many things. The project list is <laughs> endless as I'm sure we all know in any craft. Um, but I am a dress historian. So I study the history of what people wear and I, you know, by means of YouTube or whatever it is. I put my work on YouTube as I'm reconstructing things and learning about things. I'm putting those processes on YouTube and I, you know, I'm doing my, you know, to the public chatty uh, mass appeal, you know, viral videos as well. So I mainly focus on the reconstruction of historical dress. Sometimes I sort of twist and adapt them to suit modern purposes. What do I want for my own wardrobe? How can I adapt these pretty Victorian dresses to suit my own current lifestyle in 2022? Um, So currently I've got, I'm just finishing up uh, an Edwardian lingerie dress, which is those big fluffy white dresses that they would wear in the summer. That has been an ongoing project for about a year. It's taken me ages to complete, but you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, I I focus a lot in uh, late Victorian and Edwardian just because it's such an interesting period to work in. So this is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to get to talk to you because on different let's see, skills, I often go to the historical record to be able to relearn skills that are are really becoming lost, whether it's food preservation or, um, you know, uh, cooking or creating foods at a home level. Uh, A lot of that has really been lost. It's either become an industrial product at an industrial scale, or it's just gone away altogether. And so sometimes the only place that you can find good information is to really go back in the historic record. And so I just love this idea of approaching sewing in that same way. And, uh, you know, clothing is such, it's really a very intimate object, right? When you are 
dealing with somebody's clothing, especially somebody from the past, somebody historically, like you really have to dive into their life and how it worked in practice, like what it felt like every day. Were they sweating hot all the time in those long sleeves? Like you just, you really have to think about the daily practical side of it. And so I love thinking about the sewing side in history. There's so much connection between what we do. It's like we work with essentially the fundamentals of human existence. You know, people have to eat food. People have to wear clothes. So like, what can that tell us about the way that people were? And likewise, how can we look at what people were doing then to inform and to build upon how we're doing things now, how to improve our lives now? It's really cool. I know that from my studies, I find that as modern people, we we often have this, uh, I don't know, this kind of ego that we are so advanced and we have so much advancement about what we do. And, we, you know, we're so far ahead. We're light years ahead. But when you go back and you start studying what people were doing with much more basic tools, you realize that, no, no, we've actually lost a, a lot um, and are our options in our society have become much simplified, much more simplified than they were in the history books. Um, I think because of all the, the industrialization, everything's kind of the cookie cutter. We don't have all these specialized things that we used to have. Uh, do you see that same thing in the sewing world? Absolutely. I, I like to say define better <laughs> because we have this narrative these days that, you know, Back in the day, you know, things are done better now. But what does that mean? We do things faster now. We might do things cheaper now. But is the quality actually better? Does it actually bring us more joy? Like, how do you define better? Because there is certainly so much, as you say, so much just exquisite craftsmanship. The quality, the, dura the, the durability of clothing has deteriorated really from what we can see. I mean, we've got clothing surviving from 500 years ago. Are you really going to see a top from H&M surviving more than 10 years? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I, I've become frustrated, honestly, with um, the, the lack of good quality clothing, even going by the more expensive brands and not the really, you know, cheap things that people are buying here. Of course, Walmart is the place where people go to buy the cheap clothing or Target. Even when you step up to a more expensive clothing, expensive clothing manufacturer, the quality has declined significantly. I think in just the time I've been a parent, uh, just watching that decrease and decrease. And of course, the costs are going up and up. And it really makes you start thinking, where do you get the better quality clothes and maybe the option becomes to create them yourself and at some level that becomes economically viable is actually a cost savings even with the time involved uh, because the quality of clothes are just they're, they're essentially disposable clothes that we can get on the market nowadays yeah absolutely and that's one of the myths that I like to try and bust is that you need a sewing machine to be able to do all of this. First of all, you don't. People have been sewing for hundreds of years entirely by hand, but the methods that they use to sew by hand are actually different from the methods that are generally taught to us now. We are taught to hand sew to accomplish the tasks that machines can't do, which is a lot of the delicate work. But historically, when you were doing these constructional seams by hand, the methods that you use to sew those seams produce seams that are so strong, the seams will outlast the fabric in most cases these days, especially when the fabrics are might be of slightly lesser quality. I've had many garments just wear out, but the seams are still there. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so I've gotten completely off of my list of questions. <laughs> and, um, so, so let me go back to some of them because I really want to not only talk about the historical side, but I want to help people know where to get started eventually if they're interested in starting to sew. Um, and maybe they've dabbled in it a little bit, but how do we make this something that's really uh, you know, attainable for an average person. But first, before I even start there, how did you start sewing? A good question. And I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for that because I don't really remember. You know, 
you pick up a needle and you start sewing things for, I had those little figures that you use that you pose to sketch from. And I would just make things for that. Um, but I don't, I don't wholly remember my like beginning revelatory moment of this is what I need to learn how to do. Um, I kind of, you know, I had dabbled in costume making and made, you know, the costumes for school plays and things, and I never really enjoyed it, the process of sewing. It was always more of a chore. It was a means to an end. I need to get this done because this needs to get on stage. And it wasn't until I was in university and I had the opportunity to go work with a dress historian. She, one of the first conversations we had she said do you know how to sew and I said yeah I know how to sew and she said unlearn every forget everything you've been taught and she taught me from square one this is how it was done historically this is how you do it by hand this is how you do it from the perspective of we're we're approaching this from a manual labor mindset rather than a this needs to go under a machine now or this is beginning under a machine and will be finished by hand. But we are thinking about the whole process as a piece of hand, step-by-step -step manual labor. And that was when I fell in love with the process of sewing. It was less about what can I get out of this in the end and more of I'm learning so much. I'm gaining this visceral understanding of like the entirety of human existence just by taking every stitch and understanding the length of time that it takes to make these garments and understanding the variations in the tension that I have to put into the thread to make it. I feel like I'm just like doing the opposite of inspiring people to do this because I'm making it sound more <laughs> than it is. But the point is, it is such a more exhilarating process when you realize that the process, the process itself has so much to teach you rather than this is just a thing that you have to learn to produce a thing that you can use if that makes sense. I, I totally love this. Yes, I think that makes complete sense. And, you know, that ties right into things like food production, right? You know, the journey of growing the food and the connection that you have with that, it, yes, you're going to produce something that's probably better than you could get anywhere at any grocery store or restaurant, but there's also this heightened enjoyment of it because of the entire journey that you've gone through. You've struggled with it. You've babied those plants or those animals. You've gone through the whole process. And so when you come out the other side, you have this relationship with it that kind of it's transforming really in ways. And I think that's why people get hooked on this sort of a thing. I know for me as a, especially as a young mom, I found myself turning to sewing a lot because, you know, I would change the baby's diaper and half an hour later, I'd have to do it again. And I would clean the floor and I would have to do it again right away. I'd cook the meal and everybody would eat it and it would be gone. And there was this like, it didn't last. And that's, that can be defeating for some of us. So that just the act of creating something that was going to last a long time for me was that was therapy all by itself, even without the end product. So I completely identify with what you're saying there. I absolutely love it. What do you think you love the most about sewing? Is it the journey? Is it the process? Is it the end result? Or is it just kind of all of it all together? It's all of it all together, absolutely. But I think my favorite part about the concept of sewing in general is that the knowledge that this is fundamentally what I like to call an apocalypse skill. This is a skill that you can do yourself without relying on any machinery, electricity, any outside forces. If humanity, human society as we know it today were just to implode you would still have the very useful skill that you would be able to benefit other people with and yourself with those, I mean, you know, agriculture, growing, cooking food. I'm sure you understand this very well. These, these absolute fundamental skills are just, they have an inherent satisfaction to them. They do. And that our world now is so specialized in so many ways and so intangible, you know, it's, it's a very complex in that half the world's children don't even understand what they do. You know, they, they can't explain it in a way that's just foundational and makes sense uh, because it's, 
you know, data entry, or it's some, some of these high skill things that are really dependent on technology. Whereas this is just something it's so, it may not always be easy, but it's simple. It's very understandable. And like you said, it's, you know, it's kind of going back to that rubbing two sticks together, right? Like you don't need a lot. This is very basic, but what you can do with it is phenomenal. Like you can go to the extremes on uh, how much effort and energy and beauty. I've seen some of the amazing dresses that you have sewn and put in, I think, thousands of hours of work into some of the dresses. Is that correct? Am I overstating that? I have a tendency to exaggerate. So I just want to make sure I'm saying that right. <laughs> they are thousands of hours into anything yet, but we'll okay. see definitely in the hundreds. Yes. And, and you know, they're just absolutely amazing what you can create out of something that's very simple and basic. So I really, really like that. Okay. So here we are. This is a video. It's going to be on YouTube. How are you here? Like, did you ever see yourself sharing sewing skills on YouTube and your sewing journey? <laughs> we all have a story there. Um, kind of no. No, I don't think so. My initial thought about this was that I wanted something to watch while I was doing my hand sewing. I was like, why is there no YouTube channel of someone doing historical hand stitching so that I could be entertained and be kept company while I do this? And then I realized, well, you know, if you want it, you have to make it yourself effectively. And I thought, you know, I immediately dismissed it. Like, there's no way I'm, I'm not the YouTube personality. I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable in front of a camera. I'm, I'm not comfortable in front of people in general. <laughs> But I did, I did have a bit of a, you know, hobbyist background in filmmaking and, you know, enjoyed video craft. And so I thought, you know, I could, I could, you know, make some videos of, of the sewing and my first couple of videos, my face is not in them, <laughs> you know, sort of wanted to keep off the internet until things got a bit bigger than expected. <laughs> now here we are. That is so amazing. And, the, and it blesses so many of us by you stepping out of your comfort zone and sharing like that. And I know that's how we started when, when we started. I just wanted to help people. And the exact same thing. I was so frustrated by the lack of good information out there that I set out to create the videos that I wish somebody had given me or the information that I wish somebody had given me. But right at the beginning, I said, I will not do video. That was an absolute declaration that I made. I was so terrified of that. And yet here we are. Here we are. Here we all are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So why is sewing such an important skill for modern people to learn? I know we've kind of covered some of the broader reasons why the connection to history kind of putting us into you know, uh, for me, I shared a little bit of that therapy state of having something that's actually productive, having things that are real and good quality. Why would somebody actually pick this skill up nowadays when they can just run to their local Target or order something on Amazon? Well, we all wear clothes. I feel like it's just an unnecessary gap in your knowledge as a human existing in this society if you if you don't understand the most fundamental aspects of an item that you encounter every single day of your life you know it empowers you a lot it gives you a lot of control over such a arguably large aspect of your existence the way that you appear and present yourself to other people is something that communicates your personality in so many ways and to not understand to not have the control over first of all being able to repair and care for properly so that they last as long as possible these garments that you're wearing and presumably loving every day of your life is it's a bit of an unnecessary detriment <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit too dramatic with this, but the other aspect of that is that there is so much possibility with the possibility of expressing yourself in the way that you truly want to appear to the world or in a way that just intrinsically makes you happy. That, you know, just running out to target, they're not going to necessarily have. There's this whole 
absolutely exploding community of people that I found on the internet who are really into historical dress and really into adapting elements of historical dress to wear in real life. Yeah. People of all backgrounds, all ages, all sizes, taking little elements of, I love the cravats that they would wear. I love the waistcoats that they would wear. I love the long skirts and adopt, adopting those elements into their everyday wardrobes that they can then wear to work, you can go out to Target and buy something like that. But- and again, I think that goes back to that idea that we've become somehow much, somehow more advanced in the last century, two centuries, and now we can express our individuality. But when the entire population is choosing from the same set of clothing and the same mass produced stores and the same colors that somebody says are the colors of the season and the same styles that somebody says we all need to wear this style this season. It's like how much individually is there individuality is there really that's coming out versus here's a blank slate, express yourself with it. And Mm -hmm. that that's really exciting. I think, probably for some people that's very scary because it's like getting that that blank page and now you have to fill it like who am I really if I had to define my dress who is that who is that person we don't really have that option when it's just uh you know ready ready made wear off the store shelf and yet you do when you're selling so that's great that's really good so if somebody was wanting to get started with basic sewing, but they've never sewn before, we'll start with somebody who's never even attempted this. Is there anything they would need to do before they got started or is there anything that they'd really have to learn like before they even dove into a project? Um, I would just make sure that you understand the basics of what you're doing. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm all for just going going for it and experimenting and learning on the fly. There's definitely something to be said for that. But, you know, there's there are so many fantastic, you know, not to plug my own book, but, you know, books, YouTube videos for every technique you could ever possibly want to learn if you go in and type, you know, how to hem a pair of trousers. Like, there, there will be a video for that. But I would... If you're looking to start hand sewing, I would just look to start understanding the basic stitches that you will need to employ. So the running stitch, back stitch, the felling stitch or whip stitch, however you call that. Um, And just, you know, just understand the fundamental technique so that when you are faced with a seam, it's not like, where do I even start? But you know, this is how I thread the needle. This is how I start the stitch. Because so much of that initial fear, the roadblock to actually picking up the needle is, I don't even know where to start. I'm too afraid of this. But when you know, and it's sometimes it can help to, you know, actually physically write out a step-by-step list of exactly what you need to do to get to a place. So if your goal is to rehem your pair of trousers, where do I even start with that? Okay, I need to learn hand stitches first. Learn hand stitches, step one. Step two learn the correct height for hemming trousers you know just understanding fundamentally where you need to go to learn the things that will inevitably cause you the roadblock will will help you to get started I think yeah absolutely that's a good way to put it and you don't want to plug your book you were being very modest there but I'm going to fully plug your book because it it is very good and it will definitely teach you all of these things that she's talking about she goes into detail on the different types of stitches um okay this is going to be really funny that I love this here and I you know different people I'm sure flip through books and pull out very different things as to what tickles them This is one that made me happy in a very funny sort of way. And that's making buttons from your fabric. You guys see that? How to actually make your own buttons from your fabric. Like, I guess that's because it makes me feel like that's one step removed from something that I would have to go purchase, right? I can just make my own from the fabric I'm already working with. And I really like that part. So anyways check out her book. We'll have the link and everything in the description for you. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more in just a minute. I I feel like you have covered this really well, but I just want to hammer this home to people. 
do they need a sewing machine in order to sew real clothes? Like, let's say they're like, I want to sew a full skirt. I don't just mean like a little decorative pillow. I want to get into sewing. Do they need a sewing machine? So I'll put it this way. For as long as humans have not been covered in fur, we have been making clothes for ourselves from everything from medieval gowns, whether it's you're sewing stitch bits of fur and leather together, medieval gowns, those elaborate Elizabethan farthingale concoctions, 18th century Mary Antoinette, all of that's done by hand until about 1857 when the domestic sewing machine begins to become available and not until really the end of the 19th century does it really become available. It is absolutely possible, yes. Sewing machines are a time saver, absolutely. Will not deny that, but you can absolutely 100% make elaborate entire garments by hand. Absolutely amazing. That is so great. Um, I know one time I decided to make a a seven tier skirt and I decided to do that by hand and uh, all the the gathers and everything that was in there. And um, I actually was, I, I had just read something historically that, and this is probably very, very simplified of this because I really don't know very much about this topic, but that a proper stitch done to last would have 12 stitches per inch. And yeah, that's, about right. <laughs> that's about right. Okay. So that uh-huh. I set out and I thought, okay, what would this be like to do? I mean, those are tiny stitches when you're talking 12 per inch, like a 12th of an inch is a very small stitch. I'll just say I that. I will say with the caveat though, it depends on the thickness of your fabric. If you're working with a thick wool, you cannot physically get that many stitches in. <laughs> okay. <but yeah. laughs> well, this was a simple broad, broad cloth. Okay. But I have to say, I was actually surprised at how quickly I got through that project. And the reason for that was surprising to me. It's that because I didn't have to sit down at the sewing machine, I could have that project with me all the time in the little edges of the day when my family was sitting around in the evening, I could pull that out and stitch on it like that. You know, when you pull out the sewing machine, it's kind of loud. It stops the conversation. It interrupts things. And you have to really focus on what you're doing. This was so easy for me to just pick up and stitch and then put down when I had to go attend to something or, you know, I couldn't concentrate on it or whatever it was. I actually got that thing done very quickly compared to what I expected. So I guess the question becomes hand sewing is not only doable, but it's actually in some ways very viable for modern, a modern woman or man or whoever wants to partake in sewing to, to use, to actually get garments created for everyday use, isn't it? Yeah. And I like to say it's actually really wonderful, especially for our modern digital age, when a lot of us still have so much energy, so much, you know, fidgety. I don't know about you, but like, I find myself like, I've still got so much hand energy also with this, you know, very 21st century compulsion to like sit and watch Netflix all day. So like what better thing for you to be doing with your hands than something that's fairly mindless, you know, doing a backstitch seam or whatever that, you know, while you're watching Netflix or while you're standing in line to wait for the train or while you're on the train, really, if you take public transportation or, you know, waiting to get your driver's license renewed, like there's so many just mundane aspects of society today, as I'm sure there were historically, but, you know, lots of time spent listening to podcasts or audiobooks. There's so much media to consume and not really a lot to do with our hands while we do it. So it's, Mm. I mean, I, I get loads of sewing done that way. Yeah, it's actually, there's a lot of little bits of time that you can fill in with something when you do it like that. So I think that's really, for me, I really enjoy that. I identify with what you're saying about uh, the fidgeting. I, I am going, going, going constantly. And so for me to relax, I have to kind of ramp down. And this gives me something, you know, sewing, I, I do a lot of knitting. Knitting has kind of uh, been what I've been focusing on the last couple of years. And it gives me something to do with my hands. It makes me feel like I'm productive, but it allows my body to just kind of wind down. And then it's that repetitive thing. It lets my mind relax. All of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I'm relaxed now where, you know, that transition into the evening time for me is a wonderful thing. 
So if somebody wanted to start, is there an ideal project for them to start with if they're a brand new sewer, never sewed before, or maybe they want to pick up hand sewing and they haven't done that before? What sort of a project would you recommend they start with? My philosophical answer for this is you should start with the project that you're most excited about because that way you'll form those really enthusiastic associations with the process of sewing and you'll be excited about the garment that you know you will end up with if it's a garment at all um the practical answer is you know there there is the caveat that okay maybe don't start with the Marie Antoinette dress I mean by all (laughs) means go ahead and you know have a grand time I'm sure you will but you know if you're interested in historical dress, for example, you know, the best things to start with are the underlayers. So like the shifts, the chemises um, that are actually really great to wear for night dress. So you can make them and you can wear them actually and get loads of use out of them um, without necessarily having to worry about them being the most perfect garment you will ever make because no one has to see them. They're worn underneath or they're worn, in, you know, to bed or whatever. Um, but if you're not into historical dress, that's a useless recommendation because what are you going to do with a linen shift, you know, if you <laughs> want to sleep in your sweatpants or whatever, in which case it might be more um, inspiring for you to make a tote bag that you can take to the park, you know, with the print of your favorite uh, band or TV show or whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so it, it depends on on whatever makes you happy. Definitely follow your heart, but, you know, then maybe try and find, like, the square one <laughs> step of that. Like, uh, a lot of beginner sewing classes have you begin with pajama pants, tote bags, um, and then I would add to that. If you're into the costume side or the historical dress side, start with the under undergarments. <laughs> So do what you love, but uh, start with the simple version of it. (laughs) Is that right? (laughs) Good. Now, another thing you really address in this book, which I have never seen, and on your videos, that I've never seen this, and this made me really excited. Um, Many of us are trying to avoid the synthetic fabrics. These are creeping into everything in modern day life. And, you know, I just don't like the idea of wearing a plastic water bottle on my body all day long. And that's really what a lot of these fabrics are pretty much plasticized fabrics at this point. And, you know, aside from what they're doing to our environment with all the microplastics, which is a very real problem, um, they're just not good for us. I don't believe that they're good for us. And so identifying the fibers and what kind of fibers are in the fabric that you're using or that even if you're buying clothes in, honestly, like how often do you find that pre-made clothes, their fabric listing is not what they say it is? Is that an often uh, a common problem? They're not supposed to be able to do that. They're supposed to list. This is 20% cotton. 38% spandex or whatever it is. Sometimes they don't list the percentages, so you don't, they they can put cotton, but it's like 2% cotton. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that there, if you're feeling bold, there's the burn test. Um, So you can actually take a bit of the fabric and it's a bit more difficult if this is a garment and there's not really... (laughs) place to do this but if you're buying fabric you can absolutely ask for a swatch and say you know can I just just have a little swatch of this and usually they will give you one take it home and carefully you know put it under a flame over a sink or something you, you, be safe and all that but you know different fiber types react differently to flame so for example wool which is uh, flame retardant it will sort of smolder and fluff off into ash whereas it will smell like burning hair too because it's a protein fiber it's like our hair Um, whereas cotton will again it will crumble off into ash because it's a natural fiber but it will smell like burning paper because it is a cellulose fiber you know it's plant material Um, whereas polyester synthetics when you light them on fire you do have to be very careful about this because if they're petroleum based they can go up very quickly but (laughs) Yeah, so, so like do it over a bowl of water and be ready to put it out quickly. It won't, you know, explode, but it shouldn't at least unless it's treated with something horrendous. But it will, it will not 
dissolve into ash, it will melt back into a hard plastic bead. So that's how you can tell if there's any synthetic content in a fabric, even if it's blended with something, you will get some, some ash and then you will also get that congealing into plastic again. I love that. And in your book, you actually show how to do that and the different results that we have. <laughs> I keep trying to, there we go. Show the picture. Um, it, it really makes, honestly, this makes me think about children's clothing. I don't know if this is an international law, but in the United States, children's clothing has to be treated with uh, night clothing. Sleep clothing has to be treated with flame retardant. And it makes me think, you know, one bad decision often leads to another, doesn't it? If we were using natural fibers, we probably wouldn't have the fire concern that we have with children's pajamas as if we're using these synthetic fabrics which could have the you know have a very different result if there was fire I mean you've got a problem if you've got fire and children in pajamas all mixed up in the first place um, but you know so now we've got children's clothing with additional chemicals on synthetic clothing and you think we could have just started this and just had good decisions about what fabric we were using to begin with and you know yeah. use a wool or use something natural very yeah, interesting wool definitely is good uh against flame i won't necessarily claim that natural fibers are better in flame because there is a whole history especially in the 19th century of women's dresses catching on fire and those are all natural <laughs> fiber <laughs> very true that's beside the point <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I guess at least it didn't melt into a ball of plastic on your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you catch on fire and you're in synthetic, you are in a much worse position than if you were on fire in a cotton dress. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So if you were to give one tip to someone who's on the fence and thinking about learning sewing, maybe think about diving in, but they're not sure about it, what would it be? It's never a bad idea to learn a new skill. You never regret it. I'm always of the philosophy, or at least this is what I have found personally in my life, but that every single skill, no matter how irrelevant I feel like it is, filmmaking is something that I just decided to experiment with one day it all comes around to be useful eventually. You know, whether or not you're going to go into business as, as a dressmaker or whatever, but it never hurts to have a, a skill, especially in today's very strange and hypersaturated and very competitive society. It helps to be a person who doesn't just do one thing, but who, who is very versatile, who can do many things. Um, also, you know, it just in regards to looking after our dying planet, <laughs> you know, it helps to understand textiles and the things that you wear and how to take care of them so that you don't have to throw them away as often because textile waste is a problem. But, you know, that that's part of a much bigger issue. My answer to that is that it never hurts if you're feeling the inclination absolutely go for it because it will come back and serve you at some point in your life, if not immediately. Yeah, that is so great. And I, you know, what I found about learning skills is each new skill that you learn as you add new skills, you start understanding the way skills work, the way maybe it's the way your mind works and the way you can learn best, but also you start seeing patterns in the way the world works, I think. And so each new skill, when it comes to foundational things like this, really adds on to the other one. So even if you don't, you know, let's say learning the skill of fermenting, even if you don't turn around and become a lifelong fermenter, you gain an understanding of food preservation and of food and of bacteria and the way the world works in that natural environment that actually will serve you in all different areas of your life and help you learn other skills in that area too. Same thing with, uh, you know, creating and with uh, making things. Like one thing leads to understanding another thing better and that leads to understanding other other things better. And I just love the way that all goes together. So I like that theory of it's never bad, a bad idea to learn a skill. What a beautifully said thing. <laughs> Especially with handcrafts too, because there are very 
delicate muscles in your hands. And when you can learn how to develop the ability to mold things and craft things and how to hold things that you're physically making, whether or not you pursue sewing more in depth or whether you just continue doing it functionally. But let's say maybe perhaps down the line, you decide to take up bookbinding. You now understand the sort of precise nature with which you have to craft things with your hands. And that will absolutely serve you. Drawing even, you know, I have a lot of relation between drawing and painting and picking up sewing because, you know, I had already developed a lot of those very fine hand movements that served me very well in drawing that then translated over into sewing very well. So definitely, definitely useful. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you so much for me, for your time today. Thanks for joining us all the way from a very different time zone, all the way across. Oh, the no, completely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been a delight yeah. to get to chat with you. Yes, you too. You guys, if you have not seen this book yet, make sure you go grab it. It is Make, Sew, and Mend, Traditional Techniques to Sustainably Maintain and Refashion Your Clothes. It's an amazing book, a lot of fundamentals, a lot of basics, and a lot of fun um, extra stuff for those of you who are already into sewing and you want to up your skills a little bit more and make sure you go check out Bernadette on her YouTube channel. Is there anywhere else they'd get a hold of you or, or see what you're doing? YouTube, I've got a website, but that's, you know, updated occasionally. <laughs> YouTube <laughs> the I'm at the most. Okay, that sounds good. We'll put the links to all of those below. And thanks again, Bernadette. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. It was good to chat.